company. Okay, did everyone hear that? This meeting is being recorded. That's something I wanted to mention. It's being recorded. That is only the speakers and the slides will be recorded. But if you feel uncomfortable, you may want to switch your camera off now. Um, as I say, that, that, the, the pictures on the right, the, the attendees won't be recorded. So, um, yeah, as I was saying, welcome to this sole trader partnership or company. What's best for you? I'm Jo Simmons. I'm Library Services Manager at Brighton Hove City Libraries, and I'm jointly leading on the BIPC with Liz Kasman from Economic Development. Um, so our speakers today are James O'Connell. James is a partner in the commercial development of Mayo Win Baxter Solicitors. Having created and sold a number of businesses himself, as well as, well as being CEO of a financial brokerage spanning seven countries, James will draw upon lots of practical experience to supplement his broad knowledge of business law. We've also got George Clayson. He's an associate director in the business advisory team of Neil James Chartered Accountants. George provides accountancy and business advisory service to a large variety of startup and growing businesses and has extensive experience and insights into the challenges and fantastic opportunities that lie ahead for anyone starting out on their business journey. This event will help you understand why choosing the right business structure for you is crucial. George and James will talk you through the advantages and disadvantages of the three main types of business structure. Um, throughout the event, please put any questions you've got in the chat and we'll be pausing at, at different interview intervals um, to look at those questions. So before we begin today's session, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the Business and IP Centre for those of you who don't know. Um, it's shortened to BIPC for Business and IP Centre. So in 2006, the British Library in London started a service to help businesses to innovate and grow. This was hugely successful. And in 2012, with the support of local authorities and the Intellectual Property Office, a national network of BIPCs in large city libraries began to spread across the UK. This network has helped create thousands of jobs, companies, and also increase the turnover of many businesses in the UK. In 2019, Brighton Hove Libraries put in a bid and were invited to join the national network as a pilot centre. We're still a pilot centre, meaning we're still currently building up our services and beginning to work with partners. So where is the BIPC? Well, we have this fantastic newly refurbished space you can see there at Jubilee Library, which consists of this networking area with some PCs, um, and also meeting pods, and there's also a flexible conference area for workshops, which is also available for hire. Um, we've also began working in partnership with West Sussex Libraries and East Sussex Libraries, uh, and they're developing um, spokes in some of their main, main libraries. So what does a BIPC offer? We have business and intellectual property information in the form of books, online databases, and a small team of BIPC specialist library staff who can out, help you access these collections. The BIPC staff and new business partners have started to deliver free practical workshops such as this one, and we'll also, have one, we'll also be running one-to-one -one advice sessions. In the future, we'll be facilitating networking events so you can link up with other businesses. What's great is the BIPC is in a library. It's free, it's trusted, and it's a portal to other local and national services. We really want everyone, including those from marginalised or disadvantaged, disadvantaged communities, to use the service. We are looking to democratise entrepreneurship. So uh, briefly, just to let you know a bit about the databases, we've got 10 superb databases worth over £50,000. These are available for you to access for free with a library card. Some of these can be accessed at home, whilst others need to be used in the library. Uh, these databases are research tools that help you understand your market, competitors and customers' trends and ultimately make better decisions whatever stage you're at. So one, for example, Cobra, that's the complete online business reference advisor. You can use this to explore business sectors, find business support and make sure you're trading legally. It's great for anyone starting a business as, as there are over 500 business opportunity profiles covering businesses from pet grooming to snail farming, sign writing to crystal healing. Um, then we've got Grant Finder, which you can use to find uh, funding for your business if there's funding out there. Um, Newsbank, which is a global newspaper 
paper database. We've also then got company research databases such as Fame and Compass. And you can use these to search for new sales leads and find out how competitors or companies in your supply chain are performing. Then there's local data online. That resource helps you to understand what's happening in the retail, sorry, the UK retail sector right now. So that's down to the particular town, street or shopping centre. Uh, finally, we've got market and industry research such as Ibisworld, Mintel, Euromonitor and EMIS. These can help you understand what consumers want in the UK and globally and why. They also show how different markets are performing and include future trends and forecasts. So not to forget the IP part of the BIPC, I want to touch on intellectual property. Intellectual property is vital to the business process and knowing how to protect your idea, whether it's an invention or a brand name, can save you a lot of time and money. Library staff and IP professionals will soon be offering one-to-one -one IP information sessions and workshops on patents, trademarks, designs and copyright and how understanding these better can benefit your business. Since January, we've been offering one-to-one uh, -one business information clinics and that's a chance for you to meet us for free advice session to walk through your ideas in confidence, helping you to develop your business ideas and business plan using the BIPC resources. We're beginning to set up more events such as this one um, and in the future we'll be facilitating networking events so you can meet with other business owners. So we would be delighted to meet you and tell you more about the BIPC and how it can help you and how we can help you use the resources to make better business decisions. Thank you for listening to my short introduction. I'm going to hand over to James and George now. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, well, welcome. Uh, we're going to do this pretty informally, okay? Um, I'm going to talk about the legal side of things and George will talk about the accounting, finance, and record keeping and other related matters. Um, we're doing this based really on our experience over quite a few years of doing this sort of work. So we're looking at three different types of business vehicle, okay? So sole trader, partnership, and limited company. Uh, from a legal perspective, the best way to get your head around the, the, the fundamental difference between the three is if you think of a sole trader as me, myself and I, OK, it's you. OK, if you think of partnerships as like being married and you think of having a limited company as, as if you're adopting a child. OK, that is roughly analogous to uh, what the law expects of you in terms of obligations. Uh, and, and requirements to, to file records and what have you. So starting with the first one, sole trader. So what's a sole trader, okay, or also known as a sole proprietor? That's you yourself. You, one day you set up, this, you wake up and think, I'm going to start a business today. And you start trading, whatever it is, selling things, buying things, doesn't matter, okay? You, you, it's just you doing it. So what you need to be is to start, be, start being a sole trader. The answer is nothing. You just start doing it because it's you. OK, so the main advantage of a sole trader is you can start without really any any sort of form of regulation or registration at all. OK, unless you're doing something that is a, a regulated activity, like if you want to be a solicitor, please don't. It's not that great. <laughs> uh, but if you want to, be, want to be a solicitor, then there's regulatory things you have to comply with. But if it's just buying and selling or just trading or designing an app, then there's no registration, there's no regulation other than the general rules of you know, don't do tax avoidance and uh, fire safety and things like that. So that's the advantage of it. OK, so most people, when they're starting a business, think about being a sole trader because you can do it immediately. And then if it works, you can always move to one of the other uh, options. Um, What's one, what are some of the disadvantages of being a sole trader? Well, the main one is liability, okay? Me, myself, and I, okay? There is no difference between you and your business. If your business does really well, you do really well. If your business does really badly and you, you lose a lot of money, all of your assets, your house may be on the line, okay? There's no fire, well, there's no fire break. Uh, George, I'm sure we'll talk about tax. Uh, or, or, uh, at least, I mean, bring, I put words in his mouth now. I'm getting a glare of anger. Yeah. <laughs> it's <horse. laughs> um, But it, it's the main thing is that you, as a sole trader, you can do anything a business can do. You can hire staff, okay? You can have a brand name, you can get a patent, you can sign contracts, but there's no distinction between your private life and your business life. 
So what we tend to find as solicitors is that if you're running a simple company, a simple business, sorry, you know, a, a dog walking business or running a shop or something, then often your, your accounts aren't complicated. Your contracts with suppliers or, or customers aren't that complicated. Then having a sole, uh, being a sole trader can be a very good way of doing it as, as long as the tax side works. Uh, but when people start getting a bit more complicated, they're having employees, etc. cetera, uh, the accounts are difficult, then sometimes you want to move beyond that because complexity equals risk. And again, you're putting your house on the line potentially. So that, that's sort of really a sole trade from a legal perspective. It's you signing the contract. It's you taking the credit. It's you taking the blame. You're your own boss. No one can tell you what to do. But equally, if it goes wrong, everything comes back to you. So that's just very briefly a sole trader from a legal perspective. George. Yeah, thank you, James. No, that was uh, fascinating. And obviously, the legal perspective relating to sole traders does marry quite nicely, actually, with the, with the accounting perspective. Um, I think uh, to reiterate, you know, sole trade, if you set up as a sole trader, it is incredibly easy. You could go out to today, set up your business, uh, and off you go. Um, there is as a sole trader, a, a very little administrative burden. It's almost that the amount of the burden is up to the complexity of the business that you're actually undertaking. Um, and obviously you do have a certain um, uh, responsibility in terms of your taxation and uh, with HMRC. But I think um, the key to a successful sole trader business is actually uh, identifying what you're trying to achieve with it. And um, so before I go into sort of the actual requirements into sort of accounting requirements, I think it's always good to, 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 for a business to have like a, a business plan. And I think that th that is the key to understanding, I say, what your motivations are and actually where you want to take the business in the future. And if you can chart that out right from the very start with your business idea, you will have a, a, a much better idea of what's coming along further down the road and actually what your business is going to look like, whether it stays as a sole trader and then becomes a limited company or whether it just continues to be a sole trader. So I would really emphasize right from ball one, from today, if you're thinking about setting up in business to get down and do a really good business plan, um, which could be you know one page long or it could be 10 pages long. It, it really doesn't matter. But as long as it covers off a lot of very important areas, and I, I just as a sort of an opener and a, and a takeaway, if, if, if you do do a business plan, I think it should cover um, things like the, what is the unique selling point of your business? Um, what are your objectives? What are your personal objectives? What are you trying to get out of it? Is this going to be your main source of income or is it just going to be a little bit of a part time activity? Um, that plan should also include, say, your future expectations. Who's going to manage the business? How much time is it going to take up? It should also cover the marketplace. Who are you competing with and who, are you, who your customer is going to be? Really, really important to identify those things right from the start, because if, if you go into it slightly blind, um, then actually you're probably planning for a bit of a, a, a failure. Ultimately, um, the more planning you do, um, the better. So, and the, the plan should also say, include an analysis of your competitors. Um, a plan should involve what you intend to do as far as marketing goes, and also detail about operations and how the actual business is going to operate. And finally, you do need to do like a financial overview. And obviously, this is where the accounts come into it. So say, how are you going to live off this business? How much income is it going to raise? And over what period of time? Do you know when you're going to get paid for the, the services that you're going to provide? And all if you put all that together, it will help you in terms of, of deciding actually what might be what is the most appropriate structure for you. Um, so given that you've put together a business plan and at this stage you're going down the sole trade of routes, there is a checklist of things that you do need to do to put in place from an accounting side. One of the key errors, I think, uh, uh, that people make when they start out as a trader is that they blur their personal and business expenditure. And I think it's absolutely vital from ball one to make sure that you split the two um, so that you identify business and you, you keep your personal personal. So set up 
a separate business bank account. Absolutely fundamental. Um, and if you, if you do that, you then actually give the business a, a, a brand. You actually focus directly as that the business is a, is a self-functioning thing. Even if it hasn't got a separate legal entity, you're actually investing and dealing and processing and administering a business. And I, I, I can't stress that to highly enough about how important that is, that you have to see the two as separate. Um, the next thing you need to do would be to register with HMRC as a sole trader. Um, because any income that you make from your sole trader business will be taxed through your self-assessment. So that's a, something you can do online. Be, and the, the taxation methodology is that you literally, at the end of each tax year, you put in the net income on your self-assessment tax return, which, as most people know, you have to then pay by the 31st of January in the year after the, the, after the following tax year. So the, the taxation is very is very simple in terms of, the, of what you have to actually um, process and the, the administration of it. Um, the next key thing on the to-do list is choose a name for your business. It's, it's a pretty obvious thing to do, but it's, it's so important because it gives you, again, a focus about how and what your business is going to be like. Um, then the next key thing is actually to make sure that you've got the, the, the appropriate functions with, uh, the, to, to operate and invoicing and getting making sure you get paid because there's no point in being business in business if you don't, if you don't actually um, receive any money for it and again it's a lot of um, small business when they start out they they don't necessarily think about what and how they're going to get paid and who is actually going to do that for you um, it's a, a key part of, 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 of accounting for your, for your invoicing. Um, we always recommend that you do uh, get a bit of accounting software, which can actually take the ease uh, and, and the, the stress away from, uh, from you personally, because a lot of the invoicing can be done automatically. Your customers can pay online. And we're a great advocate, again, right from the start, of making sure that you get your accounts sorted and that you get your um, accounts administration sorted. And the most the easy way, depending again on the complexity of your business, is to get a good bit of um, accounting software. We would thoroughly recommend zero. Um, here at Neil James, we're zero platinum partners. And uh, most of our startup clients start using zero within two or three months of actually trading because that is gets them into a, a really good way of administering their accounts, which is going to help them um, in, in the future. Um, as I mentioned before, as the part of this checklist, you will be uh, will be paying tax, and um, but, and also you will have to pay uh, national insurance as well. And um, again, we, we can probably cover that off separately because it's quite a detailed area. But you just have to remember that when you are doing your forecast and planning for your business, that you will need to uh, make sure that you you put enough money aside. And then again, a lot of people when they start, they think all oh, that money coming in is mine, but actually it's not. Mr. Taxman is going to want a chunk of it. Um, so we often suggest that a, a certain percentage of the income that you get in, you put in park so that you've always got enough money to pay the tax when it falls due, which I say through self-assessment, but will be by the 31st of January in the following tax year. Um, if your business is successful, um, that it's, it's going to generate enough to, uh, turnover to, to, to go over the uh, VAT threshold, you will need to um, register for VAT. And again, um, if, if you know that's going to happen, that the VAT threshold is eighty-five thousand pounds. If, if you're going to, if you know that you're going to, to um, exceed that in any calendar year, um, then you need to register for VAT. But a lot of businesses um, register for VAT right from the start, and there are added, there are a lot of benefits of doing that. And a lot of the, um, the, the, the downside of, of being a sole trader is perception of size. But if you're that registered, a lot of um, other a lot of um, customers will be much more happier to deal with you because they have a perception that actually you are you're growing. You've, you've got a, 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 a minimum level of turnover that you will be. So it's a very that's a, a, an important decision. Probably a good a thing to talk, talk through with a sort of a financial your accountant uh, just to see if it is worth it. It's, a, it's an easy process to do. Again, you can do it online. Um, but getting up and running, getting the VAT. If, if, if you're going to do it, I would say get it done as soon as possible. And say if the business is for the long term, um, because I say it will help you. It will help you grow because of that perception of size. Um, and then also from accounting 
perspective, excuse me, um, there's the importance of expenses. Now, you know, there's all the lovely thing of getting your money in, but you're going to be shelling out cash for all sorts of different expenses. And it's, it's very important, A, that you keep a very, very good record of those um, with supporting documents to support whatever the expenses are. But you can claim for a whole variety of expenses, which actually will probably, again, they're very similar to those that um, we have with limited companies. So we can probably best cover those off when we, when we talk about limited companies. But record keeping is absolutely fundamental to having a successful business. If you keep good records, keep good track of your income and expenditure, then that will help you plan for the future. And also, if you do it right from the start, you, in years to come, when you're very, very successful and HMRC then start asking questions, they look back and you can say, I say, I've got all those records going, going back and they're all in very good order. Unraveling the past is one of the biggest issues that we find with a lot of, sort of growing companies when they have to go back and find records from right at the beginning. So again, a, a sort of a, a key takeaway from today would be, if you're going to start a business, make sure you keep the records good right from the very beginning to avoid future mistakes. Um, and I would get the, again, accounting sorted, um, but also I think it comes back to where I came in as far as the sole trader. It's about your vision for the future. And one of the key things is to understand where you want, what you want to do with the business, what you're aiming to achieve with it. And I'd say that will probably dictate whether you decide to be a sole trader initially and then and then go up the, the food scale to a limited company, or whether, as we'll talk about limited company in a minute, but whether actually you just go straight in and set up a limited company uh, straight away. So I hope that you the sort of little of the, of the sort of the whys and wherefores of being a sole trader. It has benefits obviously because of the simplicity of actually setup, but the downside is that a lot of um, other businesses see sole traders as they don't want to deal with them so much because of the perception of size and the fact that the liability is actually is, is, is on the individual rather than on, an, on a legal entity. And, and so a lot of larger corporates, they simply won't deal with sole traders. And it's probably a, a generality, but I think it is, is reasonably true. So there we are. That's my little piece on sole traders. Thank you very much, George. So uh, I, I had one case where when, sorry, when I have cases involving sole traders, very often it is George's point, the failure to distinguish between what is their private life expenses and activities and what is the business's expenses and activities. Now, legally, there's no distinction, but the tax man has a big distinction. So if you try and claim yearly depreciation on your dog, OK, as a business expense, you're in trouble. OK, uh, any any questions uh, as we finish the first part before we go on to partnerships? Any questions? No. George, uh, or, or George and James, I've got a question. Um, how do you go about being VAT registered? Is that just going to gov.uk? Yep, you go, yeah, go on to um, the HMRC website um, and literally you go, um, I would like to register for VAT and there is a, um, a, it's a, it's a questionnaire where they ask you lots and lots of questions and based on the answers to those questions, that process then goes through and in about three or four, for three weeks time they will then um, if, if you answer the questions correctly uh, and they're happy with what you send in uh, then they'll send you a VAT registration um, number and um, register the business so it's a very simple process I say if, if anyone wanting to sort of go through it they want a, a bit of hand holding would like some hand holding we can help them with that we're certainly happy to do that through a sort of like one of the, the one-to-ones that we're, we're offering um, because it's a, you know it is a key thing you want to get it right because I say it's a, it's an area which to, to most people it, it, you know it's just it's a it's a, a, a something you need to do but it is it can be quite complex again depending on the nature of the business that you're doing but uh, but the actual process and not and registration is yeah an online form that anyone can do. Thank you. Okay, hey, George, there? quick question from me. Uh, down here in Brighton, there are a lot of smaller lifestyle businesses that will never grow to five staff or more. And recent tax changes for earnings for um, limited companies using dividends seem to be mitigating against going the limited company route for those. What stage uh, financially should um, a sole trader be looking at converting into limited company because of the recent tax changes over the years? Well, I, I, 
I'm a, a great believer in the, in the, in the sort of the tax change is not sort of wagging the, the commercial dog, to be honest. Um, and and I think a lot of it depends on, I say, what what the objectives are of, of the business and who, and the business owners as to as to what they want to achieve with their with their business. So uh, I mean, it's, it's a hard to say. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule at all. Um, you know, obviously the the the, the, the dividend. Um, situation now is not as beneficial as it once was, but it's still um, a, I think a, the, the amount of money that you can take out for a, a limited company, you know, and for, if you are a sort of shareholder director, um, in terms of the difference, it, 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 it is still beneficial than actually going through the sole trader route. I think, you know, I say I can provide all sorts of calculations to show it, but I think the general rule of thumb is, you know, if you're, if you're drawing out as a, of a, as a sole trader somewhere in the region of 30 to 35,000, you know, it, it, they might be comparable rates of tax, but once you get over that, you know, the dividend and smaller salary route is still um, the, the, the way to go, and that is for a limited company. So, but of course, the other the other downside, obviously, is then you know, obviously, dividends are not deductible for tax purposes in the business. So, there's you know, there's still a corporation tax charge to pay as well. And sometimes again, people forget that when they go down the limited company route, they say, "Oh, I've got all my lovely part of dividends. Thank you very much." Um, but actually, then that's simply adding to a uh, a corporation tax charge and obviously that regime is changing um, over the next few years as the government tries to claw back its um, not inconsiderable bill for what we've just gone through over the last you know, 14, uh, 15 months. But um, but yeah, I, I, I'd say no, there are no hard and fast rules, I would say. Um, and uh, but I, I'd say if the, if the company is still looking to grow and it's 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 got sort of long-term plans now i'll say the limited company route i think is still is still good and then you you change the remuneration accordingly thank you would it be would it be fair to say on the liability issue that if a sole trader took out professional indemnity insurance they would largely overcome that liability problem in in, in terms of what the, the actual in, the, the in fact, that's a sort of like a legal. Uh, yes. Yeah, so in terms of generally, no. Okay. Uh, I, I find I hope there's no insurance people here. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, insurers make it their life's work not to pay out. Okay. And I, you know, and the trouble with with liability is that it can rise in a thousand different ways, and that gives them a thousand different opportunities to say. Oh, the policy didn't cover that. I mean, look, they like look what they did on COVID. I mean, they just refused to pay, and it took the Supreme Court to say, "Look, it's obvious you should have paid." So, um, and also the premiums are really high. Uh, so, I think I think you, you can you can get directors, well, not that you would be a director, but you can get some insurance cover. Uh, but I wouldn't rely I wouldn't rely on it too much as a mitigator, I'm afraid. Just don't screw up. <laughs> yes, that's, the that's probably the best way to do a lot, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I've got one further question. Thanks, Georgia. She says, "Can you apply for funding as a sole trader?" You can't. I mean, is that just general funding? I'm guessing we we could um, help you use Grant Finder to look for um, certainly our different oh. funds that you could you could apply for. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, you know, the, I think that businesses now. I'd say if you're a sole trader and you you, you know you've got a, a business proposition going out and finding the grants, it's you know they're all out there. Um, it's, a, it's a it's a question of finding the one that's appropriate for you. And there's lots of entities that will support sole traders. Um, I say again, in looking sort of further ahead, the when, when your business grows and you're looking for funding, we find that a limited company route again is is easier to get funds because um, funders are happier to either invest with share in shares or you know put loans into something which has actually you know got assets of its own so um again the li limited company route you, you find that there's a lot more opportunity to, to get funds in but actually obviously there's grants and everything available for sole traders yeah just 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 following up on that point you know one of the things about being a sole trader your assets are the business's assets and vice versa so imagine somebody's doing trading with you and they're thinking, OK, so I'm going to trade with George and if it goes wrong, I can sue him and maybe I can, I can grab his house. OK, but the reality is George is married with 15 kids. OK, because he's got way too much time in his hands during lockdown. And <laughs> so if you try and grab the house 
And then the family court jumps in and says, no, you know, the kids, kids getting housed takes priority. And so people's personal lives are very messy and that can be dragged into uh, the business world if you're a sole trader. You know, if you're getting divorced, you know, are suddenly half of your business is your partner's business because there's no distinction in law. It, it, it can get, that's one thing about sole trade. If your personal life is messy, your business life is messy. Uh, somebody just asked a question about uh, how long you have to keep records for. Uh, there's no legal time limit for keeping records from a legal perspective, but most people keep them for seven years. The reason for seven years is that the average time, length of time, limitation period is called, for somebody to bring a claim at law is six years from the, the, the event they're complaining about. So six years plus a year to be on the safe side, okay, in the case they bring their case, you know, one minute before midnight in the sixth end of the sixth year. Uh, so I would say a minimum of seven years. I know banks tend to like records to be kept for a long time. Uh, Revenue's got their own requirements. George. Well, I think it, 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 it's six years for oh, sure. HMRC, yeah. Um, but of course, if they were to investigate, they actually can go back as long as they like. So it's one of those slightly strange um, things. You know, you know, six years is fine, but actually, you know, if, you, if they investigated you and said, oh, we'd like to look into some records for 2005, and, and why haven't you got them? You know, um, you know that's their call because they, they have they all have all powers. Um, but yeah, six, six years. We're, we're running a little bit behind, uh, so can I just jump straight into partnerships? Uh, we're gonna, partnerships, we're not going to cover too much. Only 7% of businesses in the UK are partnerships, uh, so we'll devote commensurately less time to them. If you do have questions about them we don't cover, feel free to contact either of us and we're happy to carry on the dialogue. Partnerships. Um, there's two types of partnerships, unincorporated and incorporated. Okay, Unincorporated is just like a sole trader, but you're doing it with more than with one or more other people. OK, so I got this morning. I decided to go into business. I'm a sole trader. I got this morning. I decided to go into business and George wants to join me with suddenly a partnership. OK, I get a lot of business out of partnerships because they're they are messy. OK, for the most part. And the reason they're messy is that everyone, when they go into business, is a communist. OK, and they only become capitalists when there's money to fight over. OK, so if a business starts and fails, it's sorry, mate, uh. it fails, you know, good. Job. <laughs> we'll fall out when the business is suddenly made 700K and George is saying, but he always came in late. He never pulled his weight. Yeah, Actually, it's not because of, uh, in a partnership, it's it's divided. Equal. The default mechanism, the default position is that partnership assets uh, and liability are divided equally between the partners. So one third, one third, or half, half here. Okay. But of course, people tend not to do things half, half, and that causes trouble. So if you have a, a partnership, an unincorporated partnership is like a sole trader, hence the marriage analogy, but you're doing it with someone else. Okay. Or I guess if you're a Mormon with more than one person. <laughs> okay. So um, the, uh, the key thing about an unincorporated partnership is that it's not up to you. OK, the law, the Partnership Act of 1898, OK, says that if, if one or more people go into business, they have formed a partnership. You don't get any say in the matter. OK, and the Partnership Act then says if you formed a partnership, there are these. Here are the rules of the partnership. And they were written over 100 years ago. Not some of them don't really work terribly well. The way you change them is by having an agreement to change them. OK. Have it in writing because everyone forgets. And when they remember, people tend to remember it to their favor. OK, so have a partnership agreement that says, Here, like a shareholders agreement, here's how we're going to run the partnership. Here's, the, here's how we share income. Here's how we share risk. Here's how we share assets. My ass, I'm putting this asset into the partnership. Uh, let's say I own a yard and we're doing a haulage business. I'm not giving the yard to the partnership. If I gave it to the partnership, half of it would be George's immediately. I'm lending it to the partnership, okay? So if the partnership ends, I get it back. So if you're doing a partnership, be careful about it, okay? Uh, and, and do have a written agreement because when partners fall out, it's like a married couple falling out. Second type of partnership, which we're not gonna go into, is uh, an incorporated partnership. My firm, Mayo Wimbaxter Solicitors, LLP, Limited Liability Partnership. 
So you can incorporate a partnership. And people do that because there are certain benefits sometimes in having a partnership structure in terms of decision taking, liability, internal liability uh, and payment. But you want to have an incorporated uh, company that limits liability because talking about liability for unincorporated partnerships, one of the big stingers is if George screws up, not actually he wouldn't. So if I screw up, okay, <laughs> George is liable. Okay. If I cheat, George is liable. So you have complete liability as a partner. I can sign something on behalf of the partnership. George doesn't even know about it, but he's stuck with it. Okay. So in the old days when you had law firms of or accountancy firms of 30, 40 partners, that was high risk. Statistically, you're going to get a bad one who's going to, who's going to cause havoc. So limited liability partnership at least caps your liability to the amount of assets put into the, the, the partnership. And it means that your your house isn't at risk. So, but okay, because of time, I'm going to stop there. Yeah, no, well, I, I think on the partnership side, I mean, interestingly, you know, 7% of, uh, of businesses, partnerships here at Neil James, we don't seem to operate for many um, partnerships at the moment, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, I don't know whether it's the sort of cyclical thing or whether they come into, you know, become trendy or not, or I, 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 I don't know. It's, it's certainly not a, a sort of a common uh, a, a structure as perhaps there was in, in the past. I mean, the, 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 the accounting things that I've identified before for sole traders in terms of accounting records, um, the taxation, taxation is very similar um, for partnerships in terms of you have to um, submit a set of partnership accounts, but the individual partners are responsible for their own tax. And so the, their, uh, effectively their um, remuneration or income that they get from the partnership goes on their self-assessment tax return. Um, you have to say register the, the actual partnership, which has to submit a set of um, accounts to HMRC, but the individuals account for their own remuneration through self-assessment each year. Um, it's, it is a, a reasonably complex area in terms of, of accounting due to the nature of partnerships themselves. They are complex beasts because of, that's what people are like. Um, and partnership agreements can be extraordinary beasts, um, <laughs> with caveats a bit, a, a bit like rock bands and their uh, what they need to get on stage. Partners in certain firms need all sorts of goodies um, to make the thing work. Um, so I think, think that that's probably my main comment is that, that actually they're not straightforward, um, and uh, so they're, they're not as common as perhaps they might have been in the past. And uh, so, yeah, that, that, I, I don't really want to say any more. If, if, if anyone's got anything particular about um, partnerships, we can, we can deal with those sort of like in one-to-ones. Any, any quick questions on partnerships before we go on to, I'm looking at the time here, before we go on to uh, limited companies. Okay. I think I think uh, we've put them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, it was actually suing me for going to say <laughs> outrageous. Okay, so so that's so partnerships, uh, sole trader times five. Limited companies. Okay, limited companies used to be very hard to set up. Now they're very easy to set up. Uh, you can you can go to us. We'll charge you. I know four hundred pounds something like that to do it. We can go to companies made simple, twenty quid in an afternoon. OK, it's that easy. OK. Um, and I think that's why partnerships have declined, actually, because right. it used to be really hard. Setting up a limited company mm -hmm. is a really big deal. And now it's easy. Yeah. OK, so a limited company, I said it, it's from a legal perspective, it's like adopting a child. Um, a legal company is a distinct legal entity, which means that it can own assets. It can be sued. It can enter into contracts. It can be held liable for its actions. Okay. The biggest problem we have uh, with limited companies and, and their owners is owners who treat limited companies like they're sole traders. <laughs> well, you know, uh, the company, the, I had one literally last week where the person was saying was in trouble because uh, the money came in from the pop from the, the limited company. They ran a restaurant, comp came in. They needed to uh, pay some money for the kids school fees. They just took it. OK and paid to the school you can the the money is not theirs they own the business but the money is the business's money okay so money can only go into a limited company through certain formal routes and could be held either as equity as in share capital uh, as a loan uh, or a, 
very rarely a gift, okay, or, or, it's, or it generates its own profit or income, okay, and in taking it out, you can only take it out by as a salary, director's loan account repayment, which means you've paid money in on for the company, you've paid out on your own, out of your own pocket for the company, and then the company owes you so as a director's loan account that in the account says that this money is actually owed to James, okay, or a, a dividend, okay, so, but it's a separate legal entity. In terms of liability, what that means is, is that if the company's sued, you don't get sued, okay? Uh, unless you've done something completely egregious and outrageous, okay? Uh, in terms of structure, one of the advantages of limited companies, you've got the, the directors and you've got the shareholders. Shareholders don't run the company directly, they're not responsible for it. They can, behind the scenes, will have the power and influence because they can ultimately get rid of the directors, they've got leverage, okay? But the directors run the company and they take all the decisions for the company. OK, uh, that's really useful. If, you, if you've got a complex business, it means you can bring in more than one person. OK, they're employees or they are directors. The two are actually separate. Being a director is an office. OK, so you can be a director, but not an employee. You can be a director and an employee, which most of you would be as a small business. OK, uh, or you can, so, and sometimes you can be an employee, but not a director, but have the title director like, you know, executive vice president or executive director or sales director. You know, it's, it's, it's not actually a member of the board of directors. Uh, for the most part, limited companies are the way that most people go. Uh, it handles complexity very well. You can bring in investors very well. You can slice and dice rewards, responsibilities, payments, ownership, a thousand different ways. Which of course, you can't with a partnership. You can't with a sole trader. OK, they are they, they're fixed in aspect, those things. Company, you can mix and match a thousand different ways. And, and people do. Uh, they, they, it costs a little bit to run every year. But frankly, it's outweighed by the benefits. Uh, I think I'm just looking, I'm going to jump to George now, so I suspect there's going to be questions on this, so I'll, I'll jump back in at the questions. Yeah, okay, no, thank you, James. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to reiterate a lot of what you said, because um, this, yes. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, the key thing about a limited company is the, the protection um, through limited liability. I mean, it's a fundamental difference between a limited company and being a sole trader. Um, so, which means actually um, there is in, essentially no personal liability arises from the company's operations to the individual running it. That's not actually totally true because obviously sometimes if you're putting loan, getting loans and stuff, uh, people want personal guarantees from directors and shareholders and that sort of thing. So there is a personal guarantee thing, but essentially the, 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 the principle is established. Um, and... It, uh, the importance of a limited company is that, I, I, again, I mentioned it earlier, about the improved um, reputation and perception of, 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 of your trading and, and, and what you're about. And I think it, it certainly does improve your credibility within the marketplace. Um, people see you as a, uh, I'd say, this finite en this entity but that actually is separate from the individual. Um, there are, um, it is seen as a, a more perhaps tax efficient way of um, uh, for, for individuals because of certainly as a director shareholder because you can actually control how much you get paid as opposed to it just being the net income that ends up on your tax return from your sole trader business in, in, in a limited company business you can decide what salary you get what dividends you take how much money gets retained within the business so I think there's more flexibility um, that gives more opportunity for planning essentially um, but there are cons to to, to having a business like anything if it's a, a legal entity where you have to report and there there's compliance that you have to deal with then that comes at a cost but for in, in the startup area and actually for growing businesses i would say those compliance costs are coming down there are a lot of operators um who can pr provide fantastic services um to help you deal with vat returns if you're vat registered payroll um the annual accounts corporation tax returns i would say probably you know they're, they're far cheaper than they've ever been you know in my experience now you know and and the quality of stuff that, is, that comes out of, of of these operators is is, is good stuff so as i say i think the, the administrative cost and burden is is less of an issue perhaps than it might have been say 10 15 years ago and that is you know due to the obviously the digitization of everything the fact that 
there is fantastic software out there that people can use to run their business from from their phone. I mean, it's you know it's quite extraordinary. You know that you just you know, do a VAT return just like that. You can almost be zero to produce your your whole set of accounts um, and and enough information for corporation tax returns. Um, so I think that you know that's that is really important. I, I think if you make the step to being uh, uh, having a limited company, you do have to remember that you're taking on quite significant responsibilities mm -hmm. as a director. And I think, again, it's a completely different, um, I think it's a different uh, mentality to but perhaps when you're a sole trader. I think sole trader is sort of, a, there's a bit of a sort of, you, can, you feel like you can do whatever you like and you're not necessarily responsible to anyone apart from yourself. Um, with with uh, being a director, you do have responsibilities in terms of having to be compliant for all sorts of things as far as company's house, uh, HMRC, taxes, VAT, um, to, to your staff, to, uh, and the, you have to behave in a certain way. Yeah. But is I just jump in there what, very quickly. You can find yourself as a as the you can find yourself the owner of your own company because you've got all the shares. But you can act, but if you take the money out of the business and the, or the assets, use them in the wrong way. You can find that you're actually being charged with defrauding your own company, even though you, own, you actually ultimately own it. It's not you. You've adopted a child. The child's got its own independent rights. And even though you own it, you've got to play by the rules that George is talking about. Otherwise, you can actually be taken to court for stealing from your own company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, George and James. Sorry, sorry, totally interrupted you. I've just got a couple of questions coming. Oh, to yeah, fantastic. Here you go. Uh, yeah. Margaret's asking, what criteria should I use to find a good accountant? See if they look like Neil James. <laughs> well, well, I think a, a lot of it is that um, it depends, I think, on what sort of service you're after. Some people don't want to have a sort of personal relationship with their accountant. They literally want um, a set of accounts produced, uh, you know, a, a particular service done. And as long as it's done and you're not interested particularly in, in having a discussion about the numbers or anything like that. Um, so, and it, that's a, you know that's a personal choice. If it, or you want to have like a, a personal relationship with the accountant who's going to be like your sounding board and business advisor. Um, so I think you sort of have to sort of decide that sort of relate is slightly relationship driven. And then obviously a lot of it is based on cost um, because I say if, if I go onto an online provider who can do my um, accounts and uh, corporation tax uh, and that they do it through an online sort of platform, that's going to be a lot cheaper perhaps. Than um, the sort of full business advisory offering um, for um, you know, other like terms of accountants. So um, I think the, the best way to do it is to go and literally talk to as many as, as you want to, and just feel you know whether you feel that you would get on with these people, whether you, you feel that they would take your business forward. Because um, I think it's a very important relationship. But um, running a business on your own can be quite a lonely experience. Uh, and to have somebody who you feel you can pick the phone up to and have a chat with about anything and everything and, and all the business as well, I think is a very important thing. So for a lot of people, that is important. For others, it's literally a function that you need to get done. And you know, once it's done, you're not really interested in having that relationship. So uh, yeah. I, 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 wearing my own hat as a, as a, a small business owner, separate from Mailwin Baxter Partner, uh, I find that I don't know what I... I don't know when it comes to a tax, even now after all these years. So issues like, you know, uh, is is this deductible? Is this a legitimate expense? Um, do, do past losses get carried forward? Uh, if I will, they charge me more tax. A bit of neck this year. Will they? Sorry, if I made ten profit this year. Okay, will I have to pay some of next year's anticipated profit in advance? If you don't really know tax. OK, then be very wary about using these ultra cheap online systems that just fill in the information and then do it because you you may well be making big mistakes that are legal. So they're not going to pick it up. OK, but just not good for you. That if you don't know about tax, you need some, you do need some advice. It's not that straightforward. Mm. Yeah, no, 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 I agree. That the, it, that, uh, it comes back to tax, I think. It is the most complex area of, of, of accounting and bookkeeping and that sort of thing. is it reason, obviously reasonably straightforward, but tax is where the nuances are and actually where you can benefit as opposed to just somebody putting it in and not, not caring about it. So, yeah, and I'd, I'd agree with James there. 
Um, and, and a lot of online providers don't provide that sort of advisory service, whereas uh, a lot of other providers do. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much. We've got another question. Uh, Nicola's asking, how difficult is it to change from a sole trader to a limited company? <laughs> that easy. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very easy. Uh, the, the only, so uh, you could, the only complication is uh, when normally when you set up a business, a, a limited company, You'll, let's say you, 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 you've got to buy shares, okay? And they're normally one pound ordinary shares, okay? Uh, if you want to look really cheap, then you'll issue yourself one or two or 10 shares, okay? Which will immediately tell me that this is a, this is a, a hollow shell company, um, okay? Unless I look closer and in, dig into it. Uh, so, you, so let's just say you're gonna issue it with a thousand shares, okay? So you, put, you pay a thousand pounds into the company's bank account. And then that's you're up and running. OK, if you've got an existing business, then you've got to port potentially port that business into the new company. OK, if it's customers and things, that's no problem to say to them. I was trading as Margaret. I'm now trading as Margaret Limited. No big deal. OK, although, of course, it would be a new contract because the, the limited company is a different, different legal entity. So you may have to redo the contracts with them. If you've got assets, you know, uh, you, there's a there's a van you used or you've got you've bought a photocopier or whatever, then porting those assets into is more for George than me, happily to answer. But uh, that's that's an issue you've got to bear in mind that contracts have to change, have to switch across. If you've got employees, that can be is can be where it gets complicated because effectively you're 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 sacking them or making them redundant from margaret and you're re-employing them at min margaret limited but employees are a whole different area mm. yeah no i think well, i think it is a, a reasonably straightforward process i mean in terms of just setting up the company and then trading as you as you have been uh, um, as a sole trader it, it, it's that's straightforward it's the asset bit that is that is sometimes the difficulty because you might trigger a disposal um of when you transfer the assets across from being a sole trader into a limited company. That's the only thing you have to be wary of, but it's certainly not a um, not an issue that would stop you doing it by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. And actually, um, what happens a lot of the time is that, um, depending on what those assets are, uh, if, if there's just, uh, say, plant and equipment, they might be, they might have reached the point where there actually there is no um, you know, profit made by the sole trader and actually when those disposals are made into, into new code. So I say you have to look at each each item on its own merits, but um, say the actual, there's, there's no actual formal process as such. It is literally, you would set up your new company, continue to trade, get all the contracts changed, get, you, you need to get your bank accounts changed, um, do the transfers on the payroll, uh, and off you go. Um, and it's, uh, you know, and I think it, uh, we're finding, interestingly, in the current environment, there are a lot of people doing this. Um, certainly, a lot of people who, who've had sole trader activities. Um, so they might have been doing it sort of uh, as a sideline, and they suddenly realise actually they might have been at home for fourteen months, and actually they th they see this as the future. And those sidelines have suddenly become a much greater activity, which they want to make into something much more tangible. And so they've moved them away from just a bit of extra cash on the side into limited companies. Um, it's, it's, it's something that's happening more and more and more. Um, and I think it will continue to do as people's sort of working lifestyles change. And, um, you know, we are going through a change at the moment. Um, Brighton is a classic example where there's lots and lots of small businesses that are, you know, are becoming limited companies and, and looking to, to grow because the, the actual environment in Brighton is fantastic for taking startups um, and growing them. Thank you so much, um, George. Um... George and James. So we're coming up to nearly nine o'clock. Um, I don't know if you're happy to take another questions or a couple of questions and stay on. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Any more questions from anyone? Not just yet. I, I just wanted to say at this point, I'm um, thank you so much, George and James. I've I've absolutely learned quite a lot, a lot there. Lots of things I didn't know. It's been really interesting. I just wanted to point out to everyone on the call that um, George and James will be sort of doing one to one sessions um, virtually for the BIPC, hopefully starting in June. So look out on our Eventbrite page for those uh, and they're, they're absolutely free.
So um, we will be following up this session with some notes. So we've got your email addresses from Eventbrite. And um, yeah, I do hope you found this session useful. We're going to put um, a link in. Oh, thank you. So let us put a link in the chat to the Eventbrite page. So do follow us on Eventbrite. You'll find out about our one-to-one -one information sessions and yeah, one-to-one -one sessions with our partners. Um, we're also going to put a link in the chat that is a feedback form and I really, really, really would be very grateful for you to take it. It's literally one, one side of A4, about five questions. Be so grateful if you could take that time just to feedback um, about the event and how you found it, how useful. Great, there's some lovely comments coming in. People have, have found it useful. Great session. You all. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, for attending. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Really Thank helpful. You. Thank Thanks you. very much, everyone. Have a great day then. If there's yeah. no more questions, I should bid you farewell. Have a lovely day and thanks for coming. Okay, thanks, Joe. You too. Bye. Bye bye. -bye.